When I make new work, I always consider it a mini revolution. Because I believe in something and I have an idea and I want to step into an unexplored field. And I figured I always do that subconsciously according to a certain formula and I will tell a bit about that today. So let me take you back to my graduation work. I was a student at the Design Academy in Eindhoven and I had some ideas which were against the grain of my tutors because I didn't really want to want to design another so-called good design. I, uh, yeah, like that was how I was educated, but I was, I wanted to, to question design and question uh, beauty and perfection. Well, I won't tell my whole thesis here, but, but an important part was about the division of two opposite ideas of beauty and perfection. On one hand, I said there is the, what I call the man-made perfection. Um, for instance, how a car is, is designed. It should be smooth and symmetrical and a uh, certain strength. And that perfection is static. It should not change. If you have a scratch on that car, you would like to polish it away so that it looks as if it came straight from the showroom, as if time didn't exist. And on the other end, I said, like, well, there is uh, what I called organic perfection. We say nature is perfect. And here I show a random picture of a mushroom, but there are other examples to show in which you see that there are many asymmetrical shapes and a certain roughness in nature. And even fragility and, and decay are part of the beauty. So that beauty is not static, but it's organic. That's why I call it the organic perfection. So for my final work, I felt like I would like to unite those two of perfection. And in order to do so, I felt like I should not design something myself, but I should base myself on a man-made work. And instead of maintaining it as it is and keeping that original, I would do the opposite and I burned it. And the charcoal version, I would preserve in a clear epoxy resin so that was back to its original function. Well, that was my idea and that was exactly the problem that my tutors had with me because they said this is not design. They, they threatened I could not even graduate with it. It led to discussions with even the board of the academy. So, yeah, even though it seems a fearless action just to burn some pieces like that, of course I was frightened that I could not pass my exam. The resistance had quite an impact. But nevertheless, I felt I, I really want to do this. So I continued my plan. And eventually, I graduated. But for me, the most important thing was that I followed my, my intuition there. And I thought, like, that's the most important lesson. And I should keep that in mind for future projects. There was subconsciously a certain formula and I thought like can I analyze what I actually did and yeah I thought like well in a way I could define my my mind as a certain kingdom with a hierarchy in which the intuition is the king and the rational mind is his servant and fear is just a jester quite a logical hierarchy but often it goes exactly the other way around because of the rational mind and fear they have much louder voices and they easily take over the control so for me, it was the trick to listen to the distracting voices and to the negative voices even, and turn that into positive feedback to serve the king. Well, once I could do that, I could go to my next step, and that was to see the relativity of my exam. That was my final goal. Everything in the world for any graduating student is you should pass your exam. But I thought like, I deliberately choose the risk of a failure. It's the most important thing in my life for this moment, but I rather fail than, than to do something in which I don't believe. And then I also took it to the next step. And yeah, like as if you've been on a diving board, you know, you've been hesitating whether or not you should jump. But once you decide to jump, then you should go all the way. I told you about the hesitations that I had. Well, now I was in the execution part and I thought like, I'm going to presented bold and convincing because I thought like I don't know if, if I have a good idea or not but 
hypothetically, even if I have the best idea in the world, if I present it badly, then it will not come across anyway. So I gave it all I got. Well, the nice thing that is that uh, the graduation was only a stepping stone in a dream scenario, because all the magazines in the world were writing about it. It was front page on the New York Times, museums wanted to work with me, and the main gallery of New York gave me a huge solo show for which I burned 25 design classics. <laughs> so, all of a sudden I was in the spotlights of my profession, and, and it was nice, of course, a lot of praise. But the downside was, of course, there was new pressure. Not anymore for my tutors. I mean, they were wiped away by now. But, <laughs> um, but now, from all over the world, of course, people were also skeptical. Like, yeah, well, is this a one-hit wonder? Um, uh, he's burning furniture, this Dutch guy, what is he up to? Um, what's, what's the next thing? There was a bit of pressure on that, of course. Well, the place to show new work is Milan. Once a year, the city is turned into a place where all the greatest designers and the biggest brands show marvelous and spectacular new work and an international audience is coming to see the next big thing. So I thought, like, hmm, maybe I can squeeze in there and to present my new collection. Well, and in order to think about new work, I, of course, needed to go back to my mind, to my intuition. So I asked the king, like, what's the next idea? And, well, he had some ideas like, let's explore a new exciting path. There are so many of those spectacular designs in the world, but wouldn't it be more interesting to, if you look at a child uh, who's playing with Play-Doh or even a child's drawing, the, the naivety and the purity of that has a certain beauty. I show here kind of a clumsy sketch of furniture, but exactly this clumsiness, that was the plan, to translate that naivety into mature and functional pieces. Well, as you can imagine, that gave some new crisis in my royal mind because of my fear and my rational mind, and of course my ego said like, wait a minute, the whole world is watching you, they are looking for if you can do something more than burning furniture and you would come up with a clumsy series like that, you should impress the world and show that you're a skilled designer with intellectual ideas and um, the, the, the technical solution, but this wouldn't do the job. But nevertheless, they were trained to always serve the king. So I also took it to the next steps of my formula and I went all in. Um, I, I could easily go bankrupt, but the, the final goal is not that important, I thought. And, um, uh, and I rented the best place I could find in Milan and, um, and just showed a full collection of this kind of clumsy furniture. So you can imagine I was pretty nervous in between all those giants in Milan with my furniture like that. But it ended up well. And actually still today journalists are saying that the burnt furniture and the clay furniture have been game changers in the world of design. So my personal mini revolution had expanded a bit. Well, now as an artist or, or a designer, however you want to call it, um, it's my job to make those mini revolutions and explore new land. But I think it, it works for, for anyone. Like maybe if, you, if you're about to buy a new house or if you're thinking of changing your job or uh, or even if you, if you want to say something which you probably don't dare to say because of your feel of resistance. They're all potential mini-revolutions. And a revolution is never a routine. The uncertainty is part of the game. Always when I choose to make new work, I deliberately choose for a lot of frustrations and sleepless nights. But in the end, it's the most fulfilling thing to do. Uh, I mean, time flies when you're doing something you believe in, and, and it's a great adventure in the end, you know? So, well, I'll show you another of those adventures. Um, a few years later, I made this video. It's a 12-hour video, and you see two people sweeping the floor, and they're indicating the time. It's 10 past 10 now, but they keep on doing this for 12 hours. 
Well, a big produ production uh, and, and another big investment, of course. Um, and in the end, I didn't even have a physical work to show. It was, it was anyway the first time that a kind of a blend of video and art and design and performance came together in a way like this. And I really did, know, did not know where it would end. Um, but one of the end results probably you know from Amsterdam Airport, where also a man is indicating the time minute by, uh, by minute. Um, well, so far, the works I show ended up in a successful way. If you define success for the acknowledgement and the publicity and the sales, it worked out. And you might think that everything I do is a success, but that's not totally true. I made a selection for you. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it happens regularly that it doesn't, have, it doesn't tick those boxes, so to say. But I figured... I don't really mind, like, because of the success for me is an extra bonus, but not a necessity. I mean, it's still the result of my gut feeling, and I'm equally proud of it. Well, that makes me think of the, of the last formula or the infographic of the day, that I always have those two choices. Like, I can either follow my gut feeling or I can follow the safer path. And, well, it can be successful or not. Well, that leaves us with four options. Um, and I must say, I sometimes also do that to follow the safer path. I mean, I don't always feel like having sleepless nights and all the hassle. I, a bit of comfort is also nice every now and then. So then I choose the safer path. But I figure that even if I do that, and, and if that's successful in, in, any, in any interpretation of the word, then I'm not even that satisfied, not that fulfilled. I, I couldn't care less, actually. So if I would make a top four in terms of fulfillment of those four options, then this would be my top four. So you see, number one and number two are both the result of my gut feeling. So in other words, the worst case scenario that can happen when I follow my gut feeling is still better than the best case scenario of the safer path. So whenever I am about to make a choice and I feel that my my rational mind and my fear want to take me away from where my king wants to lead me, I'm thinking of this. Well, there are no copyrights on my formulas, so please feel free to use them for your own mini-revolutions. Thank you.